the mission is to take people on this journey. As we go, crypto is the big journey. Obviously, the whole finance thing is right. It's big. It's all part of the same thing. But this opportunity of a two and a half trillion dollar asset class going to a hundred trillion dollars mm. is the largest, fastest accumulation of wealth in all human history. Even if I'm a total moron, wrong by fifty percent, it's still larger than the entire market cap of the S&P that took a hundred years to build in value. Many people believe they are in a good financial position, but in reality, they are becoming poorer every year. This is the perspective of Real Vision CEO and founder Raul Pal. In his latest interview, Pal explains how to escape this financial trap by focusing on the massive growth potential of the cryptocurrency market. He predicts that the market will expand from a $2.5 trillion asset class to a $200 trillion asset class, representing a 100x increase. Pal considers this the fastest and largest accumulation of wealth in human history. He compares the growth of the cryptocurrency market to the San P500, which took 100 years to build its value, suggesting that cryptocurrency's rise will be much faster and more dramatic. Additionally, cryptocurrency is a unique global asset that allows anyone to invest, even with small amounts, making it accessible to everyone. Stick around until the end of the video as Pal shows us how to escape inflation and currency debasement. Stop, you don't have time. Don't miss out this 2025 bull run. Educate yourself first ahead of the crowd. We have created the ultimate step-by-step -step crypto cheat guide that will guide you this bull run. Unlock the secrets of crypto and make smarter investments today. Now by clicking on the link below to get your exclusive copy just under $10. I don't want people to come to me and say, why didn't we participate? They, they succeeded and we didn't. I'm like, here it is. Here's the first global homogenous asset that is fractionizable, that everybody can put 10% of their earnings in. It's the gift you've all been waiting for. So this is the one. When you buy an asset for investment, what you're doing is, is you're locking up money now to spend it later. Future deferred consumption. You need to be compensated for that, generally, because you're locking money up. So that's why long-term bond yields have a higher yield than short-term, generally. And so that asset needs to be worth more than current money today. Now, we all know about the inflation, mm. call it 2% a year, whatever the number is, we kind of all understand that bit. But after 2008, they started using liquidity, so creating more money to allow the governments to be able to pay the interest on the excess debts. And that is debasement. And we've seen it with air miles. So if you tell your mother, she's like, I don't understand what you're talking about. So do you remember when you first got your air miles on Swiss Air? And, you know, if you flew to London a few times, before you know it, you could get a flight down to Marseille. Yes. And now you fly to London for a few times, what does it get you? I, I don't know, a pair of plastic sunglasses on their website. That's debasement. That's when you excessively issue points, rewards, money, that the value goes down. And they're doing that by 8% a year on a globalized basis. So it means that any asset that you have needs to go up by more than that, or your future self is poorer. So the wage deflation, if you think about how companies pay you, whatever you do, let's assume you don't work for a big tech company to get millions of shares. Mm. Let's assume you just do an ordinary job. You go to work, you get paid. You work for Procter & Gamble, whoever it is. That company's P&L is driven by the economy. Your wages go up and down with economic growth. And so, well, they, they don't go down by economic growth. You lose your job, so you, you take a hiatus in your earnings for a period of time. However, the stock market goes up based on the debasement of currency. So therefore, your wages every year buy you less of a house, mm. less of a share of the S&P 500 or whatever stock market it is, and so and so forth. So you're getting poorer. I started this discussion back in, there was a famous piece that I did, it's got like 4 million views now, called The Retirement Crisis. Mm. I remember that. <laughs> and I explained how this was going to play out, mm. which was that young people were totally fucked and that they were never going to get up the ladder and they needed a gift. And back then, this was 2016, I said, crypto is that gift. This is the only way I can see to get out. 
And that has continued to play out to this day. And now those same people who were 30 then are now 35 and they're having kids. So they're moving out of cities, buying houses in the country because it's cheaper. They're not going to work in the office because it's cheaper. They have to bring up their kids and they can't afford a nanny. And they still can't get ahead. They've got school fees and retirement and their house. Are they renting a house? Do they own a house? Chances are they don't own one yet. And they're, they're, they know they're fucked. Everybody knows they're fucked. And they don't know how to get out of it. And that whole idea, once you understand that people know they're fucked, it explains a lot of how the world works. It explains why we get the left and right polarity. I've got to blame somebody for why I'm fucked. Mm. Then it is, it's also the rise of the speculative economy. Why? Because I'm never going to get ahead. Mm. I have to take risk. That explains GameStop. It all came from Occupy Wall Street. It all came from the same thing. It's all the same movement of these people realizing that their future has been robbed because the baby boomers took too much debts on because there was too many of them and the economy couldn't cope with that. So it's a, it's a long economic story that got there, mm. but the present day is we need to take action. Well, it's not from wages. So people are doing two jobs. We all are. Mm. Bizarrely, right? We're all doing a multitude of jobs. That's in itself weird, but we've kind of adjusted to it, saying it's normal. Then they're having to learn how to speculate. They all became financialized. 2020 was like, that whole generation didn't care about real vision. Did, there were some people who studied the masters of finance and stuff. Yeah, sure, they cared. They didn't care about markets. They didn't care about anything. They just didn't give a shit. They cared about Instagram. 2020 came and suddenly they were given money and they were at home and they were given a game to play and they saw the, the future. And that was the largest, fastest financialization of people, I think, in all history. It was astonishing. Liquidity cycle is actually somewhat mid-curve, meaning it's an over-explanation for a simple thing. Simple thing is all you need to know is number go up. The whole system is set for number go up. So therefore, just be involved in that number go up and own the asset that goes up the most. It's, it's, it's that simple. When I say this, I say it humorously, but it's true. Yeah. <laughs> right. The whole system is set for number go up. That's what debasement of currency does. Mm. When you have an over-indebted system, the collateral of the system, the assets, can't go down. Because if not, you've got too much debt versus the assets. And that's what happened in 2008. So the whole system is based on that. The baby boomers are all going into retirement. You can't let the assets go down. Because if not, they've got all the wealth. So therefore, consumption will collapse. Mm. The number can't go down. So as opposed to number go up, you could say the number can't go down. So the liquidity cycle is just an element of that. It's the actual mechanism by which it happens. If you're 30, you shouldn't give a shit about that cycle. You should just use any weakness to keep buying more mm. number go up assets. For others, it then becomes a cycle to try to take some risk off the table because it's a volatile space, particularly in crypto or technology investing. Both work well. But then you come to the question is, and most people get to this, is everyone thinks, yeah, I'm going to take money off. And then you're like, and where am I going to put it? Because when as soon as I take it off, debasement's happening again. So you might put it in stable coins for a bit. Sure, definitely cash in lifestyle chips. Buy that house. Do that thing that you want. But after that, it's difficult to think about getting out. The reason Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world is because he didn't sell his Amazon equity. Mm. Right? People forget that compounding returns. Bitcoin, since 2012, is up 22 million percent. It's 140% a year. In that is four down 85% bear markets. And it's still that. 
Solana was down 97.5% last cycle, or 98.5%, sorry. It is still compounding at 240% returns a year. It's happening now already, and we've barely started. Mm. People are now seeing 100x in memes. And they've gone from, I've been telling people, please play that game. Sure, do it with 10%. Keep 90% of your allocation or 80% if you're a total degen, mm. just in the main tokens. Then you can't screw it up. Mm. Don't use leverage, self-custody, you'll be okay. But I can see it already. People are gravitating towards the influencers who are talking about memes. The main characters, people like Ansem in this cycle, are getting more and more attention mm. because people are desperate to make money in the shortest period of time. And they don't realize that compounding at 150% return, which is Bitcoin, which is the worst performing of the major assets, 150%, you don't need to be in it very long for that to compound to massive returns. Mm. But they want to make it all this time. And so I can see them losing their minds already. They're not using leverage yet. They're kind of scared of that, but they will. However much we tell them, please don't use leverage, they will use leverage. However much we tell them, please don't yield farm in weird shit because you're getting a 60% yield, they will do it. Uh, and I, I beg them, yeah. but they, don't, they won't listen. I don't go for yield. Even that whole yeah. crazy thing where they claim that I had been involved in Luna and all of yeah. this stuff. No, no, I know, I know. Like, it was, we'll talk about that later, actually, yeah. in, the, in a third part where things are taken out of context. Yeah, but my point was always, hmm. I was a macro guy who bought call options or put options, yep. yeah. and I never sold them hmm. because I don't like that risk. And when I saw blow-ups, I would see in macro land, people taking huge bets, they went wrong, they blew up. I'm like, fine. Hmm. But then I would see these yield guys... And they would be clipping 2%, 2%, 2%, 2%, 2% a month, and then they'd be down 50. And they, it was that risk. If you've got a natural order of volatility in a fund, that's okay. But when you've got this perfect non-volatility, and then that, it's catastrophic. You'll lose all your investors, you'll lose everything. Mm. And that's what yield does to people. And that's where your background in traditional finance basically was massively helpful because you, you've seen it multiple times. And even in, when you compare it to, you know, the, the, the risk asset, the risk curve, like you're just basically saying, hey, look, it's all the same. Nothing is new in crypto, nothing. No, we're humans and we, no. <laughs> we value things in certain ways. Mm. And I've seen it every time. So I was lucky enough to be involved in, there was a, the oldest bank in England, Bering Brothers blew up from Nick Leeson, based in Singapore, who was rogue trading. It became a film called Rogue Trader. That was him selling volatility on the Nikkei. And he sold so much, it eventually blew up. It was basically yield mm -hmm. through a different way. Then cut through to 1998, the big blow up, long-term capital. Again, they were looking, using stupid leverage to get small returns. When something goes wrong, that leverage goes the wrong way. Mm. Saw so all of that. 2008 was that all over again. The history is littered with excess leverage to, to juice yields. That combination is the killer. Raul Pal explains how we can escape the inflation and debasement trap. He believes that if wages do not increase at the same rate as money printing, workers effectively become poorer over time. This highlights why simply saving money is insufficient, as its value keeps decreasing. With this in mind, Pell encourages long-term investment strategies and a deeper understanding of the broader economic context. He emphasizes the importance of compounding returns over time, which can significantly enhance wealth despite the depreciating value of money. Additionally, Pell warns against trying to time the market or make quick profits. Instead, he advocates for patience and informed investment decisions, which can help individuals build and preserve wealth in the face of inflation and currency debasement. For more Daily Dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.